Good morning, Spring Arbor. Welcome to chapel. Good to be with you this morning. I want to give a quick shout out to those who are joining us online. And I think we have a few admissions folks. I see a couple of parents, maybe some with uh, athletics. Thanks for joining us today. Good to have you with us. My name is Brian Kono. I'm the chaplain here at Spring Arbor University. We get together here on Mondays and Wednesdays at 10.05, where we get to hear worship, worship together, and then hear from a, a speaker, hear from God's Word. So I hope you have a, a good, do, good day today as you visit. Let me run through a couple of announcements as we get started. There is no deeper tonight, so just want to make sure you're aware of that. Uh, in Pulling Lobby, we have Painting Against Pollution. Come out and learn more about pollution in the Pacific Islands and Asian countries around the world while you get to paint your own tote bag. On Friday, we have the Community of Learners, which happens once a month. That t This Friday, we're um, hearing from Shirley Hoopstra, who is the president of the uh, the network that Christian universities are a part of, Christian universities like ours, and she's going to be talking about what do evangelical Christians want for America. Spanish Club is meeting Friday night, 7 to 8.30, Ralph Carey Forum. Even if you are unable to speak Spanish, habla espanol, feel free to come out and join the party. Also on Friday night is Shanks and Slushies come out and hear a little bit from Randy in concert. On Sunday is Cold Stone style ice cream and board games, 7 o'clock in the Cougar Den. And just a quick heads up, make sure you're aware that this next Friday, not this coming Friday, but the following Friday is the Spring Fling, the formal. So make sure you have your formal attire dusted off and ready for that dance. This week also, softball is home tonight, or today, Friday and Saturday. Uh, tennis, it, men's and women are both home today, and I think on women on Saturday. Um, and baseball, I think, is traveling all week. So today, we get to hear from uh, the second part of the dynamic duo on Spring Arbor's campus. I hope you enjoyed Terry's message on Monday. You get to hear from his better looking half today. Mary is here. Uh, I asked her how long she'd been here and she wouldn't tell me. Uh, I think you heard some of their story Monday when Dr. Darling spoke. Um, but I would, one of the, a couple of things that are interesting about Mary, she used to serve, when she started, she was in student development, which is what myself and the student leaders, uh, and those who oversee student leaders are a part of, and she actually chaired the chapel committee with my predecessor, Ron Capico, and uh, she helped put things like chapel together, among uh, several other things. And one of the things that I, I just appreciate about Mary and Terry is that their, their heart for the Lord is evident in all they do, and their love for Spring Arbor and our students is, it makes them the, um, what I would call the, the poster children of Spring Arbor faculty, um, just serving as models, role models for people like me who are just a few years younger than them. Uh, so I'm excited to hear what Mary has to share with us. She is a professor in the communications department, but she has, for a long time, she taught in our spiritual formation program that we had for a number of years. And she brings that to us today, that expertise and that depth to us today. Uh, today, we're going to pray for her after worship, and we have some special guests leading us in worship today, a, a fraction of... Uh, a live city, the group Live City is going to lead us in worship today. So Zach and his wife Haley and John are going to come and lead us in worship. Come on up. Um, and they are going to be in concert next week in White Auditorium along with uh, Luke LaPrad and Quasa Pro. So um, look forward to hearing that next, Friday, next Wednesday night. 
look forward to helping, allowing them to lead us in worship today. Alana Taylor is going to come and lead us in our call to worship. Good morning, everybody. Today's call to worship comes from Philippians 4.8, which says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. So as we spend time in worship this morning, just let yourself dwell on God's goodness and things that are from above and just take this time to be present in this moment. And let's worship together. This is crazy because I actually went to Spring Arbor my freshman year of college. So here we are, full circle, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now guys, guys, I want us for a second, think about your, your absolute most memorable moment at Spring Arbor, okay? Just get it in your mind, figure out what, like, what was that? Because I have mine and I'm about to share it, okay? <laughs> so this is, this is freshman year. There's like a certain, there's a certain class that they take us to. It, it was an introduction to Spring Arbor. And part of our, <laughs> part of our class, we went into the wilderness. And this is, this is how I became a vegetarian. So you might, you might know what I'm talking about. They, <laughs> they had us, and this is amazing. And this is not a negative memory. This is a positive memory. <laughs> They taught us how to kill a chicken with our bare hands. Praise God. And that's why we're back here today. So good morning, guys. Let's go into a time of worship. So hey, if you know these songs, feel free to sing them nice and loud with us. Here we go, here we go. Sing it out. 
Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescue me. Hallelujah, I'm free. And I stand on the chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus on the power. Closer than a brother, and there is no judgment. Oh, how he loves me! I've got a friend, and he is my strength, and he is my portion, and with me. Not alone, 
And I've nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. be magnified let his praise arise Christ be magnified sing it up the altar of my life Christ Articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry from north to south and east. We hear cry. Rejoice cause you're there too No I won't be formed by feelings I hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you And cause death is just a door Into resurrection life And if I join you in your suffering then I join you when you rise, and when you return in glory with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing, my soul be the same. Sing it all. At this time, I would like to invite Mary up to the front and 
anyone else who would like to pray with us, come forward right now. just thank you for this beautiful morning and this chance to gather here today and worship you and just give you glory. Um, thank you that Mary gets to speak a message that is straight from you, from your heart. Um, I pray that it would resonate with us, that we would hear your voice. Lord, I just pray that you would also calm any anxiety or nerves in her mind and that she would just enjoy this time to speak to us and that she would be hearing your voice as she is sharing with us. And Lord, just thank you for your presence in this place and give us ears to hear and may these words bear fruit. Um, we glorify you today and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. So I wanted to thank Alana. Where'd you go? <laughs> Wherever you went. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. I, and thank you, Alive City. Thank you for everyone who prayed for me. That's really powerful. I really appreciate that. Um, so if uh, you were here on Monday, I just want to clarify something my husband Terry said. Because uh, <laughs> I get the last say here, right? <laughs> So he mentioned that I like to announce things, which is true. I'm not going to argue with that. But uh, he said that I announce things like I'm going to the bathroom. And I wanted to clarify that that means that I am on my way to the bathroom, not that I'm already in the bathroom announcing that. Uh, so just wanted to make sure you knew that. So uh, Terry also, he talked about how relationships are the most important factor in having a happy, hopeful life. And he gave several ways that we can have better friendships. So this morning, I just want to add on one additional communication practice. And I love talking about communication practices and connecting them to spiritual practices in my classrooms. And so I'm, I'm just doing, we're just talking about one additional communication practice this morning. And that is to ask more questions. All right, but not just any questions, all right? So whether or not we're aware, our lives are guided by questions, right? Some good, some not so good. So I found this Google search of questions, and I'm, there, there were like a thousand of them, so we're not going to do all those this morning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a few from the top 100. I was really surprised by this. The top question that's usually Googled is, what is my IP address? And then, not far behind that was, how do you tie a tie? And then, when is Mother's Day, which you all need to know that, it's May 14. Uh, how do you make slime? How do you draw a dog? How do I delete my Facebook account, which makes sense when you see the next one, it's how do I hack a Facebook account? <laughs> Number 90, I was a little bit depressed about this, is how old is Justin Bieber? And I, one of the reasons I was depressed is that was number 90. Number 99 was, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> number 100 was, how many calories in a banana? <laughs> All right, so here are some that you might be thinking right now. Why didn't I go to bed earlier last night? Yeah. Why didn't I do my homework earlier? Is Jackson ever going to get a Chick-fil-A? <laughs> Is the weather good for our game today, this week? Was that a bad call at the game last week? Where's my phone? <laughs> and most importantly, 
Will the DC have tater tots today? <laughs> so life is full of many questions. I want to encourage you to ask today what a good friend of ours, Joel Van Dyke, calls beautiful questions. Let's see. Yay. Okay. Uh, he also sent us an article that puts it this way. The beautiful questions are the hard questions that many are afraid to ask. They are the questions for which, for which many are ready with pat answers, but the really beautiful questions do not have easy answers. Instead, the answers often lead us to other hard questions. So beautiful questions change us if and if, only if, we pay attention to them. And so taking them seriously can guide our lives in ways that we can't even imagine right now. I think you've heard this uh, before, our verse of the year. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And I'm always focused on that part of that that says, you know, I, I, I need to be prepared. I don't want us to forget that a, a question has been asked, a beautiful question and so the question, it, there could be a couple different ways to word these. What is the reason for the hope that you have? Or can you tell me about the hope that you have? The week before Easter, I asked our five-year-old granddaughter, Nora, to tell me what Easter means to her. And she started it with a question, and it was so cute. She said, do you know what my favorite part of Easter is? And she said this very seriously, the whole thing. She said, Jesus well, I kind of like candy too, but mostly Jesus. And then she added, and my church, which I think is a great answer. She asked a beautiful question, and then she gave a beautiful answer for the reason for hope. So we could also ask beautiful, hopeful questions, the questions that lead to a hopeful life the life you've always wanted. Perhaps you can't even imagine that, envision that. It could be because of some long-standing things. It could be because of present circumstances. It could be about worries for the future. Um, but Jesus, Jesus asked beautiful questions, and he asked a lot of them. And so what I want us to do in the time that we have is we're going to look at two of the beautiful questions that Jesus asked and one beautiful question from the Old Testament that guided Jesus' life. And hopefully the three questions that we talk about this morning will inspire you to ask beautiful questions too. All right, so picture this. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, the, uh, John the Baptist is with two of his disciples, and Jesus comes along and John says, look, the Lamb of God. And John's two disciples turn and start following Jesus. Now there's a lot you could unpack there. The fact that John knew his place uh, and let his disciples go. But what I want you to focus on this morning is, is that picture of the two disciples, John's disciples following Jesus. And at some point while Jesus is walking, he turns around and he asks our first beautiful question of the morning, and that is, what do you want? What do you want? That is a question that I encourage all of us to ask ourselves, and I'll get back to that in a minute, but one of commentary puts it this way. Jesus has a habit of coming right to the most important questions. And this is a commentary on this verse. In this case, his question is the same one God asks everyone who claims, who claims to seek him. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? The reasons a person seeks Jesus are just as important as what they find. What a person wants affects what they're willing to have. So I challenge you to put yourself in that scene regularly. Picture yourself. Picture yourself walking down this dusty road and picture Jesus in front of you and Jesus turns around and says, what do you want? And so I encourage you to do that as a spiritual practice and I encourage you to do it regularly. And that leads us into the second beautiful question I want us to look at. This one also comes from John, uh, the John chapter 5. And I don't know if you can see all this. I'm going to read it. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colored colonnades. 
Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Okay, so let's stop there for a second. Uh, it, you know, if, if he'd only been there for a couple days, weeks, months, 38 years, he could not get, his reason was he could not get down there because, because someone else always went ahead. It seems like maybe you could do a little planning ahead for that and get an earlier start. And but that's not what he said. He had an excuse for why he couldn't get well. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. Do you want to be healed is another version of this. Do you want to get well? Do you want to be healed? I also highly recommend that you put yourself in this scene with Jesus asking you this question. Uh, and if you want a really good picture of this, I highly recommend that you watch this scene in The Chosen, in the second season of The Chosen. It is really powerful. Remember, 38 years, he had excuses. Jesus called him out on it with a beautiful question. But, and then he required him to take action. He required action. Do you, you said, get up your, get, uh, pick up your mat and get up. So do something. So here's the thing. It is really possible that we won't even know the answer to that first question, what do you want, until you admit that there are things you need to be healed from. And in this, we're talking about a physical healing, at least that's how we're reading it. There was a physical healing. We don't know what else was going on with him. But it could be emotional, it could be relational, it could relate to fear and anxiety, it could relate to anger issues, it could relate to guilt and shame. There are all kinds of things that you could fill in there possibly. But I highly encourage you to think about this question for you. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to get well with whatever that is that's holding you back? I have dealt with a lot of fear and anxiety in my life. I really appreciated the prayers for that this morning. And I heard it from more than one of you. And Alana, I appreciated it if I heard you saying it. Um, I, the fears and anxieties that I've had in my life have really held me back at times from what I believe that Jesus wants for me. I, uh, I have anxiety on both sides of my family. You know, I'm a nature-nurture person, I believe that, married to a psychologist. Um, and, but I, I do have a lot of anxieties, a lot of anxiety in my family. And so I feel like I was born with a lot of it. And when I was a little girl, I had to come home from a sleepover one night because I was scared. And there was something on the news, and I thought, I have to get home. And so I refused to stay overnight. And it wasn't anything directly related to where we were living, but I had to go home and guess where I lived? Across the street. Across the street. Didn't even have to get in a car. I mean, that's the kind of anxiety that I would have. And I, it wasn't until I acknowledged the healing that I needed with the help of my husband um, that I started to get some healing and started to be able to respond to what is our third question this morning. But before we get there, I want you to raise your hand if you're graduating next month or this coming fall. Okay, look around. We've got a lot of graduates here. So, congrats. Um, do your homework. <laughs> got one more month. <laughs> um, not right now. <laughs> Don't do it right now. So, I'm sure you have questions, right? You have questions. What job should I apply for? What's my next step? If I do have a job lined up, is it what I really want? If you are a follower of Jesus, hopefully you're asking, what does God want me to do? Or the way that we often put it, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? Did you know that the answer to that is in the Old Testament? Now, there's a lot of questions in the Bible that we call rhetorical. They're not meaning to be answered when they're asked. This one is asked and then answered right away. 
and it is this. Okay, Kono, tell me just to wait a sec. There we go. What does the Lord require of you, or what does God require of you? Did you know that's in there? That's a form of what is God's will for you. And then it's answered. It's Micah 6, 8 in this order. It's do justice or act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. Uh, I love the version that says love kindness. Another version says love tenderly, but I love the love kindness. And so there's, when you're talking about how do I do justice, that's hard and it's hard to sustain. And so I've got some questions here that I encourage you to ask yourself. I'll just read these. What resources do I have to help change what needs to be changed? What resources does my community have? We aren't called to do this alone. Can I listen to what people really need rather than what I think they need? Do I know what beautiful questions to ask? And do I have helpful information? Do I have helpful connections? Now, if we're honest with ourselves, we might want to share up to a point, but we might not be willing to share the resources that God's calling us to share, the resources that we have. But all you have to do is look around our world, and you know that, uh, that we need people to be sharing. And we need that desperately, and it's very consistent with our concept to be critical participants in the world. So how can we share? How can we be motivated to share, even sacrificially? By the next one. So it's doing justice and then loving mercy. Or like I said, loving kindness. If we love kindness, we do kindness. They're interwoven. Okay, so how? So our son David, he's the director of tennis here. Tennis team, shout out. Hello. Thank you. Love the tennis teams. Um, so they, David and our daughter-in-law, Jenna, they have two sons. And they're really pushing kindness with them. They're telling them, you know, that what, what we, we want you to be kind, and so they say that to them a lot. Uh, but Liam, their four-year-old, has been having a little trouble with it with his two-year-old brother, Sutton. And so last fall, David was on the way home from preschool with Liam, and he said, Liam, uh, are you going to be kind to your brother today? And in a really serious voice from the back seat, Liam said, I'm going to be a little bit kind but not too kind. I think God intends in Micah 6, 8 to be a little more in than that and not just a little bit in, but we are a little bit in more often than we realize. And we aren't four years old anymore. So I'm going to cut him a little slack. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, gives us a lot of ways to be kind, to be loving. Oh, so many and they can sound great at a wedding. And as a matter of fact, they did sound great at a wedding that we were at just last Saturday when President Ellis talked beautifully about this chapter. And we need to be reminded about it and the directives in it often. So here they are. Love is patient. So you can be asking yourself these things. Am I patient? So we're talking about how to be kind here, loving kindness. It does not envy. Okay, oh boy, we've got trouble, right? It does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it do, it's not self-seeking, not easily angered, and here's the one that always gets me, if the other ones haven't, it keeps no record of wrong. It keep, you can turn these into questions, right? Do I keep record of wrong? Am I patient? Am I kind? Do I rejoice with the truth? And not delight in evil? Do I protect, trust, hope, persevere? And then there's the one in other verses. There are over 30 of those in the Bible with so many things that parallel 1 Corinthians 13. And one of them is, is forgive one another. I mean, again, this can look great on paper. This can sound great in chapel. But when I need to forgive, what do I do? Angel Kono talked a couple weeks ago about forgiveness right here. It was beautiful. I encourage you to go listen to it again if you're struggling with how do I forgive or how do I deal with the whole idea of forgiveness. And another one, uh, with another one of the 
one of my favorite one another verses is as much as it depends on you live at peace with everyone so we again we can have good intentions about following all of these but it can be hard to be all in i'm just going to be a little bit patient today not too patient but we need to be all in with them every day so how can we be all in and live these verses daily by the third part of the micah 6 8 verse by walking humbly with god so how do we do this well walking humbly implies it's an ongoing act i love how it's worded walking humbly if we walk with someone we spend lots of time with them i mean do you ever think about that how often jesus they walked they walked all the time they walked miles sometimes daily just miles and miles and that they, they you spend a lot of time with someone when you walk with them my friend lisa and i have walked together for over 25 years we you know someone really well when you walk with them for over 25 years so walking humbly also implies walking humbly with god implies a certain kind of time with god and it's the kind that results in the fruit of the spirit so when our boys, David and Michael, were seven and eight years old, we took the first of two out west trips. We were gone for three weeks, and I added it up, because that's what I do, and it was 90 hours total in the van, the four of us, 90 hours. So I thought, I want this to go really well. So I talked to Terry about this idea. He thought it was a good one. I think they had just been to a VBS where it was about the fruit of the Spirit, or like the year before. and so. I said, let's have them each pick a fruit of the Spirit each day, and they're going to practice that that day. And, and so that's what we did. Day one, I remember this because I wrote it down years ago. They did. They picked joy. One picked joy. David picked joy. Michael picked patience. And it went really well. We were all in a good mood, and it went really well. And so there was a lot of joyfulness. They were patient. Um, but then the next day we so we spent 13 hours in the van that day and i think it just already started to get old so the next day they picked patience and kindness and not long into the trip the second day they started like arguing with each other and getting mad about something i don't remember what that was didn't write that down and so at one point just as the day went on because it didn't happen constantly but as the day got went on it got worse and at one point i turn around they're having an argument i turn around and i go david that doesn't sound very kind michael that doesn't sound very patient i mean first of all listen to me that wasn't a really great way to respond and terry turns to me and says this fruit thing isn't working <laughs> and it wasn't and it, it took me longer than I want to admit to realize why. And I don't know if any of you have already realized it sitting there. I was trying to get our boys to do something that is the result of something else. It's a fruit. So I'm not going to plant something and then go, grow now, I want you to grow today. It's a byproduct. And I think we forget about that. It is a really important spiritual principle. And uh, some people call it, uh, like Richard Foster and Dallas Willard, who write a lot about spiritual practices, call it indirection. That there are some things you can't do directly. So it's by, it's, well, I'm going to, spoiler alert almost there. Uh, so you, you do something, you say, you don't say to yourself, I'm going to, I'm going to practice humility. If you did that, if you said, I'm going to be more humble, you could easily become prideful. But you do other things that are sacrificial. You do other things that maybe you don't let anybody know you're doing in secret and good things. And, and those are some ways to become humble. It's a fruit. It's a byproduct of something else. In Luke chapter 4, we see references to this with Jesus, doing what he did because he was empowered by the Spirit. Now, you might say, well, he has a little advantage being the Son of God. Then you haven't read philippians 2 it's the humility chapter where jesus gave it all up richard foster wrote jesus didn't just wake up one day and start spouting nice things about god he came from a life of learning a life of reading the bible a life of of walking with god of spending time alone with god there's several passages about jesus spending time alone with god and so back to luke chapter 4 
It, it says that he was empowered by the Spirit. It says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. And you know how he survived that and those temptations? He, everything he said to Satan was scripture. That means he knew it. Like, again, he didn't come out of the womb knowing it. You know, we know that Jesus learned and learned and learned and spent lots of time with God. In Luke 14, it says Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Don't miss that when you're reading Luke 4. News about him spread through the whole countryside. And then in Luke, look how two of my favorite verses, Luke 4, 18 through 19. Look at how this starts. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the takeaway, for the fruit of the Spirit to grow in us, we need to spend time with God. And if you aren't sure, and I just forgot to bring it up with me. You don't have to bring it up. I have this book I forgot to bring up. It's called the Spiritual Practices Handbook. Some of you in my classes have used it. It's very thick, and it has hundreds of spiritual practices in it. It's by Adele Calhoun, and it is just a wonderful book full of practices. So there's no excuse if we say we don't know what to do. And there's no excuse if we say we can't get alone anywhere because one of the, one of the important uh, practices is to, is to spend time alone with God. One of my favorite examples of this is Susanna Wesley, who is John Wesley's uh, mother. We're Wesleyan here, a uh, Wesleyan tradition. And we're free Methodists, but it's Wesleyan tradition. And Susanna Wesley uh, gave birth to 19 children. Uh, at many times in her life, her kitchen was full of children, and that's where most of uh, life happened in their house. And she, uh, she would tell her children, she had a, a chair in her kitchen, and she told her children, when I put, she sit down, when I'm sitting down with my apron over my head, that's my quiet time, you cannot disturb me. So we have no excuse if we think we can't get alone. And it is so important to spend time alone with God. Psalm 139, 24 through 25 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. One of my all-time favorite verses, Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. I'm a six on the Enneagram. Those of you who know me, you have to know I wouldn't, get, I wouldn't go through a whole chapel talk without mentioning the Enneagram. I have trouble being still. If you're a six, I've got a phrase for you. It's called mental chatter. We're in a, in a thinking triad center, and there's a lot of mental chat, chat, chatter. Nothing has changed me more in the last 20 years than learning to be still with God, mostly through a a practice called a spiritual practice called centering which a friend of mine calls a returning prayer i like that too returning prayer sitting with god in stillness no words only silence seems easy really hard really hard um, it takes a lot of showing up and being kind and patient and loving to yourself because if you are anything like me it is so hard but do you know what happens when we're still we learn to listen to what the Bible calls the still, small voice of God. That is the Spirit of God, which then helps us to be kinder and more merciful to our neighbor, which then helps us to do justice. And it is that ongoing cycle of what God requires of us. Walking humbly with God, listening to the voice of the Spirit, will help us to listen better to others, which helps us to ask better questions. Always the more beautiful answer who asks the more beautiful question. Beautiful questions change us. I encourage you to write these three down, or if you just happen to have your phone out, put them as a repeating reminder and commit to spending time with them regularly. Regularly asking yourself these questions 
and other beautiful questions like these can not only make your life, but the lives that you come in contact with more beautiful. Please pray with me. Dear God, help us to find what we want in you, to want to be healed from whatever keeps us from loving you, ourselves, and others, and to do what you require of us, doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with you all the days of our lives. Amen. So be it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.